today we are continuing our webinar series um, with our suite of webinars to support schools with their digital thinking and today we have um, Al Kingsley here from Classroom Cloud who are our headlines uh, partners for our research pro project Where Are We Now um, and we're delighted to have you here Al could you just introduce yourself and let everybody know uh, what you've been up to? I am happy to and welcome and hello to everybody who's listening in. I'm, I'm Al Kingsley. I'm Group CEO at NetSupport who generate and create Classroom Cloud. Um, I've been involved in the EdTech space for about 30 years and wear a few hats. So very much focused around educational technology, but I'm a chair of a multi-academy trust, been an alternative provision and sit on the advisory board for the East of England with the DFE. So education, skills, technology, they all weave quite nicely into the things that I am the business to. Lovely. Thank you, Al. And we're also joined um, by Ed Fairfield. Ed, could you just introduce yourself? Hello there. Um, I'm Ed Fairfield. I'm vice chair of uh, NACE, uh, the EdTech Association. Uh, I'm al also company director of uh, supplier of technology into education um, and uh, school governor looking after well-being and computing. Um, so uh, today it's um, a general uh, tickety-boo, as uh, Al said earlier, uh, chat uh, with Al, but it's in the context of our EdTech Where Are We Now uh, research. So uh, my interpretation of where we are now uh, with technology, uh, nobody really knows. Uh, I think in the past 10, 15 years, it, there's a lot of fragmentation. Uh, people are doing their own thing. Um, and what this research aims to understand is from a, a, a UK point of view, uh, where are we as a sector and where, how do we vary within different schools and trusts um, and individuals as well? Uh, and also how do we vary in different types of technology? So school management, teaching and learning, professional development, uh, all of the elements that cover the NACE EdTech Review Framework. So let's have a bit of a delve into that. Lovely. Um, Al, when you and I spoke earlier, um, we mm. spoke about the, the right here, the right now, the current picture that schools are facing. Um, and obviously, as a leader in a school myself, I'm, I'm driving, I'm doing all that I can to think about how I'm going to prepare my pupils digitally for this world that they're entering. Um, and, I, and I'm constantly thinking about how digital fits into the here and now in a manageable way. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that? I have. So if you buckle up for a couple of hours, I'll tell you my first headline thoughts and then we can go a bit deeper. Um, <laughs> I think that's the challenge, isn't it? There's so much to talk about, you know, and I try and put, you know, I often say you need to look at digital educational technology through a wider lens, which is really a sense of um, it might seem more manageable to look at specific challenges and issues and how technology fits in, but actually you need to look at the broader ecosystem. And so I think where we are right now in, in terms of technology in schools sits in a number of different buckets of, of influence. So, so we have one which is about basic need, where we have to use tools because it's a way of us being able to function in a, in a growing school system. And you could argue that moving from LA to academies and clusters of schools amplifies the need for some technology, whether it's our MIS systems and student data, whether it's about legislation that drives us to do things and make sure we're keeping our children safe online and other activities. Then we've got the funding model from a national context of each of our countries that drives more often than not the capital funds to what technology do we have the ability with the right evidence to introduce into our schools and i'd argue probably now a few years post pandemic our challenge is what technology can we afford to refresh and renew within our school systems then we get the next bucket which is a massive explosion and evolution of the tools that are available to choose from. And with those comes huge opportunities, but also comes with a challenge because if you know there's lots of great tools out there, how do you identify the great ones versus the good ones versus the not so good? Are we driving based on need, what we need within our schools, or are we being driven by what's available? And that creates an extra barrier. And sometimes, actually, if you can't see the wood from the trees, the best option is just to pause and reflect. 
that doesn't necessarily help everybody but it's not a bad and fairly pragmatic approach of we need to figure out what works well and what doesn't work well so although there's been some great pockets of progress in the role of technology within our schools um, i very much advocate that one of the things that's really important for us is to look backwards before we move forwards and i think that ties in with the research piece which is before we build and say we're going to add X, Y and Z to try and meet our needs and we can talk about the what we want and how we're going to deliver it, we kind of need to start with the why. Why are we doing this? What are the actual drivers behind that? And so the reflective bit, which is something that educators are pretty strong at as a general trait, is what technology have we already got? What works well? How do we know it works well? What evidence of impact can we measure? And those measures are a fluid thing and are changing significantly i think in recent years so that we can actually build our foundations with a sense of confidence because i think you know all of this comes down to confidence it comes down to teachers confidence and digital skills using technology effectively it comes down to that alignment of technology and pedagogy and it also aligns then with our students digital skills to engage and use the tools we've got right now but also the broader digital skills agenda of how do we equip our learners ready for the workplace and an ever-changing landscape. And then we just sprinkle AI, big data, cybersecurity, and all those other things on top. And we sit and think, this is why it needs to be a, a many hours conversation and we have to break it down into bite-sized chunks. I think that's an excellent point about uh, helping schools to just to pause because I think they're such fast paced um, establishments, especially at the moment. It just feels that we're just running and trying to keep on top of everything. But that advice to just pause and look at maybe the technology that we've already got without kind of just adding more and adding more, um, it, it will be really helpful for leaders to hear that. I think there's increasingly I see and only yesterday I was tr doing a, a trust digital strategy meeting and we were talking through uh, and you have the big ambitions, don't you? The things that we could do and introduce into our ecosystem. And yet when you unpick the layers, the first starter for 10 was how do we build staff to confidence with the iPads that were deployed to them two years ago so that actually the tasks take them 30 seconds instead of 60 seconds? The basics of splitting windows, opening, copying, pasting, moving data. And then if you, in their case, in Office 365 Trust, where are the confidence levels with Teams, with OneNote, with the core applications? And there's a sense that you need to build capacity and confidence first before you layer on top. I think I'd always also argue right now that we, we've been pre-programmed for quite a while when we talk about the role of technology amongst other variables. When we measure outcomes and what we're trying to achieve we put it in the context of student attainment or progress some some measure that's that's what we're always judged on right there's a league table or a, a status or if you're not so good a letter from the local authority that reminds you of where your priorities are but actually if we look at the real pressure in our schools right now we'd be saying what technology could we use that would reduce teacher workload would close the feedback loop would consolidate the way we do things that would save us money because it's our budgets it's our recruitment and retention it's our semh with our learners that are the real challenges right now and if you haven't got those foundations right you can put all the teaching and learning on top you like but you're not going to hit what you want to achieve so there's an also an element of instead of thinking about what's the next curriculum tool how can we think about how the technology can actually help teachers so that they've got more time for that really important thing the human to human interaction with learners um, and get some of the other things done more effectively which feeds in nicely when the, the topic which always surfaces when we talk tech at the moment when we talk about ai you know are, are we are we prioritizing tools to um, engage in, and stimulate teaching and learning or are we looking at tools that help reduce preparation of lesson planning and other resources and automating maybe the not, not the final draft but the the drafts that we can use for letters and communications and policies and other things that really sap the time away from the core exercise so the why bit i, I kind of alluded to comes back into that conversation when you're looking at your digital strategy or perhaps digital vision because You've got to align that with your school development plan, with your CEF, with everything else to say, why are we doing this? What are the real pressures we've got right now? And can we be big and bold and say, actually, our priorities are this, not necessarily the default that you think is this, but this will improve as a byproduct of implementing some of these other things. Um, 
And if you can structure the why and you can communicate the why, what often is the other challenge in schools is people are told we're adopting X or Y, we're now using this tool, but don't really have the picture of what we're trying to achieve. Well, we all know any change, you know, any project, we'd much rather bring people along for the journey rather than drag them by the ankles. And I think that's another one where we just have to pause and reflect again. Mm. So, Thanks. I think, sorry, Ed. Who do you think is driving the agenda of um, EdTech? So um, you've been around for longer than I have. I think it's uh, fair to say. So in the early 2000s, my understanding is there was uh, it was policy led and there was more of a, a government uh, vision mm. compared to now. Um, so the kind of the balance of power, if I'm right, is shifting to the big brands, the Microsofts, the Googles, uh, um, and the, the, the Canva type uh, big brands coming in, the newbies, um, and also AI, of course. Um, and as a result, the sector is reacting to what they're coming up with um, and trying to find uh, solutions. You know, how, how do I use AI? It, it's kind of reactive. It's the wrong, the wrong way around, I, I would suggest. Is that true? Where, where's the agenda? Where's the balance of power? Think, and are we coming at it from the right direction? Uh, listen, I think there's, there's a number of points you raised there, Ed, that are absolutely valid. I mean, I think certainly we could look over the last 25 years and say the the influence and strategic direction from government when it comes to the role of technology and, frankly, any evolution of change within the education system has diminished we've gone from being proactive to reactive most government yeah. policy is how do we put something to protect based on something that's already happened or some technology that's already available um and you know i i say it as i see it the, the problem is technology education needs a long-term planning long-term change it's about a cycle and an evolution government is pre-programmed to introduce political change on policy change that can be effective and measured within one political cycle and some of these levers for education are not something you can do in a four or five year window and so we tend to avoid the big things and just tinker around the edges and that tinkering around the edges creates disruption for staff and for schools because we're always changing the goalposts or the or the expectations we place when it comes to technology it, it's certainly true that we've gone from uh, an ed tech ecosystem with lots of specialists and products within what I would class as and, and continues to be a very tight and collaborative community within the UK um, that is still absolutely thriving to having greater influence from the platforms. So, you know, I'm agnostic and I, and I mean no um, disrespect to any of these platforms, but absolutely, if we think about the big multinationals that provide a platform for all verticals of which education is just one, their influence has grown considerably in terms of shaping the narrative. Uh, and at some level, that's to blame of the government too, because we now see policy groups around, and you use the example of AI, and yet we see on the boards of those policy groups, we see um, angel investors and representatives from the Amazons and Microsofts and Google of this world. So we're bringing it to the, to the table and we need to be clear that whilst much of what they contribute is, is very helpful, there's also an agenda there, which is their organizations, their specialism mm -hmm. is not education. And within the AI context, we know that actually the, the real value that is being extracted is data sets, the, the content that allows us to refine those products that are commercial products and ultimately draw revenue from those users that use them on a, on a regular basis. Um, I have, as you know, I, I wear a hat um, chairing the EdTech group at the British Education Suppliers Association, who are very um, proactive in sharing the voice around EdTech, much in the same way as NACE is doing in terms of making sure we get evidence around the um, the, the use of technology. Um, I, I think it dilutes the market to not have organisations that specialise in the space being at the heart of the conversations. And I think what we've learned for many years in every sector is that there is not some measure of quality or value of tools based on the size of the uh, the, the organization that creates them in fact many of the 
products that I look at and think, yeah, that's something that's going to be woven into the future landscape are about small startups and SMEs that are innovating. Yeah. You know, so when we go to the biggest, what we tend to do is we level down. We level down to the minimum specification, and, and that's not helpful in the context of what we're trying to do in educational technology. Um, so the government, you know, I'll say it as is, I think are complicit in not having a clear vision, not providing a, a space and a landscape to ensure they capture the full voice. Um, I mean, let's be honest, if we're talking about educational technology, half the table should be technologists who specialize in it and half mm -hmm. the table should be educators and, yeah. and it, it it has to be co-produced based on that it can't be co-produced based on the people who stand to make the most or the ones that frankly we are in a marketplace where there is limited choice when it comes to the platform and space you use in the same way as if you're a cloud-based application you've only really got two or three mainstream places that you can host it and they will be deriving a money for every transaction that accrues on that platform so we need to be a little bit more say it as it is rather than perhaps sometimes just pat around the edges. Super. Um, I'm just going to move the conversation on. Um, Before I get so too contentious, is that? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, you're, you're, going... you're, you're, you're right, Al. There are that many webinars we could string out from here. I'm, I was bubbling up with all sorts of responses to what you said then. <laughs> <laughs> but let's keep it on the agenda on where, where Sarah's guiding us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to bring us back to something you mentioned, Al, about staff wellbeing. Because when I spoke mm. to you before, we spoke about technology um, acting as a lever to other mm. areas of the school. So, so it's not just um, ed tech, as you've already mentioned, for teaching and learning, but that, but that overspill of the lever. Could we pick up that? conversation please yeah absolutely i mean i think the first thing to remember is we talk about ed tech and our, and our brains are programmed or most people's perhaps perhaps not everybody uh, to immediately think of technology in the classroom you know we need to remember there's more technology outside the classroom in a modern multi-academy trust than there is within mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. ecosystem is much much broader um, if we come back to that, what are our strategic priorities? I mean, maybe you could say as you do each term and you review through, you've got your, your school or your trust risk register. Well, I guarantee you the things on that list will be about recruitment and retention, staff retention, the risks when it comes to communication, vulnerable children. There'll be lists there about finance and infrastructure and how you're going to maintain things. You'll have a thing about if there's another COVID outbreak. You know, the, the list goes on. Um, and so if we think about our priorities and we say, well, look, what are the levers we can influence? One of the most important ones has to be how do we use technology to support our staff? Now, if we go back to the pandemic, and again, I, I'm not platform specific, or I'm very agnostic on it, but take a Microsoft school. You know, most teachers uh, and staff within the school thought Teams was a new version of Skype full stop it was just a messaging app right you know and the evolution was well we can actually use this in a far more powerful way for fostering um, communication between our staff but in a multi-academy trust we want to be able to use teams to have you know the the history department in one school communicating with the history department in another school and sharing resources and sharing pd and making sure that we don't miss out on opportunities and events but we can also have channels which are much more just focused around well-being and actually supporting staff and having a place where we can have, as we do in our trust, you know, a well-being group where we're capturing and sharing that. And that might link to some of the online resources that we provide to the school to support our staff. But then we'd come right the way back and say, well, what are the, the levers and the measures that can actually technology can actually help with? So, you know, at, at the pandemic time, a lot of staff had moved in schools from having a laptop to having a fixed computer at the front of the class. That was their device. And that was quite handy because it meant if a member of staff wasn't there and you had cover, there was always a computer in the room to drive the interactive screen or board. Roll on to working remotely and suddenly you don't have a device in your hands. And when you start moving around a school, actually, you build confidence by your technology comes with you and you know what's on that device and you know it's going to work and you build confidence in using it. So the idea of making people comfortable with the core tools, putting the right tools in the hands of the teachers is a starter for 10 in terms of confidence. Now, in primary, 
teachers are rarely in one place they're constantly moving around the classroom so the right technology fits so you learn that maybe one size doesn't fit all you know a teacher in a primary phase or perhaps a science teacher might want a tablet whereas another teacher might want a laptop because it's more suited to what they're doing would look and say well actually with some of the tools we can define our rubrics when we're doing um forms and questioning in, in, in Office 365 and we can assign our rubrics to it that will help with marking schemes and auto marking and that, that closes down the feedback loop that reduces down some teacher workload. We look at other tools and we say well there's some great personalized learning tools now that allow children to continue what's been done in class and if they answer lots of questions right it can provide stretch and challenge and if they don't it can take them back a few steps to reinforce foundational knowledge. And then we say, well, part of that then is looking at what other tools can support staff with content creation, preparation, as well as potentially some of the marking side. Although I think that's weaker currently in terms of technology that does that. It's all about context at the end of the day, but certainly the tools that reduce workload and then tie in with the SCMH. So, you know, if I'm thinking about staff workload and well-being, actually, one of the things we learned was actually the automated online tools for parents evenings meant that meetings didn't overrun, staff got away in good time or were able to go home first. And so now we have a hybrid version. We use it sometimes for some of our parents' evenings because we still feel that that con control over what running late is really important. Um, a big one, recent conversation um, in, in my trust, you know, we need to do less emails and use our channels, teams for messaging more effectively because in terms of well-being, we're getting staff with hundreds of emails a day or emails out of hours. And an email tends to be when it arrives on your device, a bit of a shouty, look at me, look at me, ding, I've got another one. But we could actually channel that into you know, a Teams channel or a Slack channel or whatever platforms we're using. And we could minimize that sense of constant urgency to staff and allow them to dip into it when time allows i think that the, the biggest one of all is you know the digital strategy we have in our trust has the usual levers that you would expect we want to innovate teaching and learning we want to develop staff digital skills we want to develop student digital skills we want to make sure we've got the right infrastructure that will scale that allows our trust to grow and other schools to join our infrastructure um, but we always have we have communication as a core one because that's both in school between staff and leadership but also with parents in the community but well-being is one of our pillars of our digital strategy so everything we do we say for example is the best product for our school the most complicated one with the most features you know it used to be compare three products you'd put the brochures side by side and say oh that one's got more buttons on that's the one we need well we've got a bit smarter than that now when we've said actually the tool we want is the one that's the easiest to use the simplest one to do what we need the one that's most reliable most secure and then the list goes on as we do our dpia on the on the background bits but actually, it's not about the most complicated because there's loads of features that products do that we just don't need. And yeah. every teacher and class cohort will be different. So we're back to a very, very new concept of keep it simple, stupid, aren't we? You know, the easy to acquire minimum training, the ones that teachers can adopt. Um, and because I'm going off on a little bit of a round tour, the other one is what? What is it when it comes to digital and CPD? Why is it we think we have an hour or two introduction to an app at the start of the academic year and then that's your lot? You know, I use the analogy. Do you think Manchester United have one training session at the start of the season and then say that's it till the cup final? How are we weaving in to what we're doing, not just regular professional development on the tools? And that doesn't mean in your own time, go watch some more YouTube videos. How are we signposting the flag bearers in our schools or trust? Who's the go to person for Teams or for Google Meet or whatever the tool is that you're using or for Canva and, and so on? Um, so that you can build confidence by knowing you've got peers you can reach out to and say, I'm struggling with this. Can you give me some ideas, some pointers, how I can best do that? Um, and the question I often ask in, a, in when I walk in the door of a mat and meet with the leadership team is, you can show me a phone book now that tells me who are the contacts in MFL across your trust. So who are your classroom cloud flag bearers? Who are your uh, OneNote flag bearers? Who are the people that staff go to? And, and they can't tell me. Well, if I'm a new teacher in the school and I'm wanting to pick up the tools that this school uses, I'd make it a lot easier if I did that. Right now, with the adoption, simple adoption of some AI tools to support content preparation, curation for staff, 
one of our main priorities we have in the trust is you've got to record the stuff that works well and then at the end of the academic year we're going to do a teach meet where we're going to basically have staff say what we've got a very finite list of tools that can use but what worked well what kind of question prompting worked well for you what output worked and more importantly what didn't because at the moment we'll have i guarantee you in every school in the country we will have some people who are highly proficient using some new tools and some people who are highly intimidated by them but nobody knows because it's all in those individual silos and so you know that's what leadership's about isn't it C gathering those voices and making sure that we can bring the best bits together absolutely and i think as you've mentioned the confidence of staff is absolutely key to support their well-being. So, so I think you, you've illustrated that really, really well. Thank you. If we're moving on now to another aspect that I think teachers are feeling at the moment is that we as a school and other colleagues I've spoken to in other schools, um, we're, we're meeting with pupils who are perhaps more disengaged to be in the classroom learning in that traditional yeah. style than they ever have been and i think that also is impacting on staff well-being but also it's on uh, it's on the outcomes that are being classed by mm. not only by the children who are who are struggling with it but the, the wider class um as well how how or if there's any link to technology with that do you feel I, listen personally big time um i, I mean it's it's very easy to to try and paint technology as the panacea to everything and in this case it absolutely is not so let's get that clear from a starter for 10 you know some of our challenges I mean, one of the other big challenges on our risk register we could all talk about at the moment would be attendance wouldn't we and we'd all be saying my goodness we used to be up in the high 90s and now many schools are struggling to get to 90 um, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of young people and sadly parents that don't necessarily see that the value of school or, or the traditional education space i think it's perfectly fair to say that for some of our learners with complex needs we're trying to keep them in the mainstream setting when it's not appropriate because there isn't the the right specialist provision available for our learners and i, I do worry sometimes we set them up for failure however when we think about technology and dis disengaged learners i think there's a number of challenges you know sometimes a disengaged learner isn't it presents themselves as being a challenging learner because of the frustrations and their their, their, their lack of confidence within a traditional learning setting uh, and a few years ago um, after a rather tough offset inspection I, I was asked by the local authority to step in to chair a pupil referral unit and find it a new home and 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 set it on a journey um, and they had some of what they would define as some of the most challenging young people that really struggled in a mainstream setting um, and not surprisingly, sadly, many of them did not have high academic output and certainly weren't leaving at the end of their journey with a high number of qualifications. Well, you know, and aside to this, step one was a, a child going to an alternative provision with the right support and nurture shouldn't be there very long. If they're there for a long term journey, they're doing it wrong is the first point. Mm -hmm. But for those that were there, it was about, well, how are we accommodating those kind of children's needs in what is quite a rigid educational system so we all know if we have young learners we would be looking at assistive technology and other tools or screen reading pens and all sorts of other bits and pieces that might engage with our learners but we don't change the goalposts and measures at the end and i kind of say right now you know with the advent of siri alexa and other things there are many pupils at uh, alternative provision that if you know, i sat down for an hour and talked about a subject i would glean far more than giving them a piece of paper and a pen the, pe the pen would last about five to ten minutes before they were disengaged and that wasn't really reflective so so a bigger picture one is we need to change the way we capture assessment and be more flexible to, to suit learners needs but we can also alongside that technology we can think well what else can work for disengaged learners or children struggling with their mainstream so you know a good example it's not a new tool it's a, many would say it's a game and it is a game but it can also be used for more um, for our year six year seven transitions from primary to secondary some of our learners aren't ready for a full secondary experience so they have in effect a primary class within the secondary phase and they gradually in become interwoven into the full moving around the school experience over a number of months 
but in that setting rather than attending english and being introduced to the concepts and works of shakespeare to start with they're using minecraft to design and develop the globe theater um, but whilst they're designing and developing it, they're talking about the history, what it's there, what it relates to, why the stage is in a certain place. They're engaging in a different way. You know, there are some teachers that say, actually, some of the gamification has options. Minecraft is a great way of developing a concept of resources and measurements and capturing lots of other bits and pieces. Um, in our infant school part of our trust, we have a learning journey bus. It's a coach that we acquired and has been converted. And inside um, it has tablets. It has we use for virtual uh, reality, particularly augmented reality capture with our learners. Uh, we have VR headsets and it's an area where we have very high deprivation. Many of our children have not experienced it, all the rich opportunities we'd hope by this stage they would have experienced. And with their headsets, they engage in all sorts of experiences that prompt the cabalry, creative imagination that then feeds into discussion and writing in different ways. Now, sometimes, I guess, from an education perspective, you could say, hang on a second, Al, that sounds all very experiential, but does it really feed into teaching and learning? And my answer is, well, if a child is engaged and they're talking about it and they're discussing it and they're using some vocabulary, then that's absolutely a step forward for a child that otherwise would have been sat and not part of that journey. Um, we can look at technology and we can say there's all sorts of digital books available now that the same book will present three different levels of complexity of language depending on the age and stage of the child. So all the children in the class can be reading Jack and the Beanstalk, but some of them have got a quite a complex story to read and some have got some really very simplified words for the story. But they're all reading the same thing from the outside. They're all included. And one of my things with digital technology is we shouldn't be introducing complex digital that actually becomes more of a divider between some of the cohort of children and others. We want technology that all of the children can engage with. So, you know, alongside the assistive technologies and they continue to improve, um, there is also the opportunity to use technology to generate that wow and stimulation that gets children involved. Probably the best example right now is we're seeing, particularly post-16, esports flourishing and blooming, you know, and that's something that creates a whole wealth of skills. And we might right now see it as a little bit of a, well, that's a really nice thing, but it doesn't really align with the, the broader curriculum. If you've got a cohort of young people who potentially are going to struggle to get any academic qualifications at GCSE, other than potentially something around, you know, a, what was the computer driving license or something similar, actually opportunities for them to achieve and succeed in a qualification, I think if it provides them with a discipline to practice, to develop, to communicate, to work in a team, they're all transferable skills that they can take to the workplace. And they're the things that I think have shifted from the kind of soft skills to be what I refer to as power skills now. They're what employers want. So I think at every age and stage, you've got an opportunity to use technology to provide ways, if you're creative thinking, to get disengaged learners involved. I've seen some fantastic work linked to forest schools and other bits where, you know, taking a tablet out and identifying flora and fauna, using it as a capture point to create your own digital journal of your activities. There are lots of things that suddenly make learning not seem like it's learning, but it's something cool to do with technology. Uh, and, and there are other times where I'm, I'm the first to say some of the best lessons don't involve any technology at all. They're just expression yeah. and interaction on a human level. Absolutely. There's a lot of magic and best practice there, uh, a lot of pockets of brilliance. Uh, and I think uh, most schools don't have the capacity or understanding or time or vision to kind of recreate those, it's fair to say. So I wonder what we can do, because NACE is all about school improvement, uh, using technology for school improvement. A really important part of that is sharing um, and uh, understanding what good looks like and then sharing it and empowering others to, to do it as well and to replicate it. And I think there's a big gap in the mechanisms of doing that in our sector. So all of that stuff you talked about, love it all. How do we get the 10,000 local authority primary schools who don't have the time to even think about that, let alone do it? I think that's our challenge for next year and beyond to kind of enable that uh, to to flourish yeah. and to happen. 
there's a lot there's a lot of different avenues there isn't there you know i mean i i think my best definition of me is i'm a bit of an edgy magpie i call myself an edgy sponge but the truth is we all know that the natural persuasion when we're introducing some project or challenge within our school is we look for the leaders within our system the people who've got confidence in whether it's digital or whether it's in sen whatever the challenge is and we get them to move forward with a, with an approach um, I think we've somewhat, maybe it's the pandemic, probably more re realistically, it's time and capacity, the killer of most of the things we want to achieve. Yeah. Um, we, we've lost the skill of looking outward facing and actually mm -hmm. using the, the contacts and the PLN that we have around us. Yeah. Um, and there are some conferences that are cool, but they don't necessarily drive change when people come back. There's pockets no. of ideas and bits. They're and there are others audience, where, aren't they? People that people listen and they're inspired and then they leave. Yeah. And they're I mean, not I've, often it. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair enough. I mean, there are some some great ones where people are either inspirational or they try to do, as I try and do, kind of provide an action list or a checklist at the end of yeah. a session. So you've got something to take away. But I think the power is, you know, I, I often hear different people say, you know, it, the, it's the, the power of the network over the node. And I think in this case, it's about there's two parts one part is about providing platforms for best practice to be have a light shone on it so that we can actually see who's doing what because we all want evidence informed we all want to know and say how did you do it how did it work well and then in, in parallel to that we do need some basic frameworks we need we need a framework that says you know how do you evaluate what you've already got and we need a framework that says how do i choose the right tools for my school now i mean i provide a kind of a a stepping stone guide to how to how to evaluate and choose the right technology split between the pedagogy and the technical and then how do i effectively evaluate it but you know it's intended to be a simple starter for 10 that you can adapt so i think well considered frameworks that give us the how do i do's is really important mm -hmm. but we've also got to balance it with i don't and this is meant with no disregard to those same frameworks that i'm encouraging we need to recognize for school leaders that it isn't a you must follow this because every school and setting is different. Everybody yeah. starts from a different landscape of the technology they've already got. Mm -hmm. They all have a different budget. And most importantly of all, they've got a different teaching cohort who will all be on their own journey in terms of their digital and professional yeah. development. So to say you have to prescribe along this journey clearly is just not going to work. Um, what yeah. we need to do is give people visibility to say, here's a framework that you can follow, but you absolutely need to reflect on that framework first and see which bits are relevant to your school and which bits maybe you want to ask slightly different questions because you're at a different point in time. Um, and there are some amazing people who are out there sharing best practice and there's some great stuff happening in schools whether it's from a, a pedagogy perspective on how technology is saving time and enhancing learning to how technology is is connecting with engaged learners and moving forward with greater innovation whether it's in xr <coughs> and ai or whether it's just in the broader use there's some great examples of how data is being more effectively used rather than it just being with capturing lots of data in our trust but we only go to it when we've got a problem how are we using data effectively to inform and provide us with a steer when we need to have interventions on learning before there becomes a problem so all these different pockets it's about recognizing and bringing them together and, and you know that's something that i try and do on a regular basis well i try and do it on a weekly basis but on a broader picture and try to do it in events and i think you know what the research with nace is doing is hopefully capturing insights from lots of different educators and teachers showcasing where their their pain points as well as their success points are right now mm -hmm. um and that gives you a base to say well look there's a so there's a consolidation here of lessons learned of what not to do and there's a consolidation here of maybe these are the priorities that you want to start to build on maybe these are yeah. the levers that for others have allowed them to move things forward recognizing that 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 measure of pace is unique to every school i refuse in our trust for example to put a date on any of our digital ambitions because no matter what we aspire to do in the next year there will be other challenges that come along there will be other pressures on our teaching cohort and 
for the right reasons, that will often mean that the last thing we want to do is for our ambitions to be another pressure, another sword of Damocles. And so that starts at the top with this is not a race. There's no badges. You know, I love technology, but I don't want my schools to be the most technological. I want them to be the schools that can showcase they use it most effectively when it's yeah. appropriate. Very good. It's inspirational to hear you say that. And uh, it's great as a leader to, to know that that is is happening. Um, I'm just thinking now and I'm moving towards the end. I've just got one more one more uh, kind of avenue to go down for those schools who are stagnant or that they're, they're feeling that they're still at the moment or they've yet to even step into the digital world. Mm. What advice would you have for them? How, how would you help them avoid seeing technology as a bolt on yeah and an inconvenience and an inconvenience yeah what advice well, would you have yeah I mean, and that that's a, that's a huge one isn't it i mean for those teachers of a certain age i'd say don't panic captain mannering but unless you're familiar with dad's army that's going to go straight over the top of people's heads you know the first thing is every piece of change every introduction of technology at any stage comes initially with as much trepidation and fear as it does with opportunity and excitement um, i always kick off events with a word cloud from inset that i've done with different schools and there's there's you know exciting innovation you know all these positive words and then there's kind of fear and time and oh goodness and it's that natural persuasion but you know the the challenge with technology is, is is not the known knowns it's the it's the unknowns so the, right now for everybody who's talking about ai as having the potential to revolutionize to change to support to nurture we go through this curve of excitement and then we fall back down to that oh hang on a second and we normally come back to a middle point in that position and i think the same with technology the natural fear sits there so how do we move forward and the first thing i say which um I could be accused of being a little bit ageist, but seeing as I've got plenty of grey hairs, I can probably get away with it. It's unlike many topics, when it comes to the role of technology in the classroom, sometimes the senior leadership team are not the best people to lead that project. Because technology is new, it's ever-changing, and therefore often SLT don't have the lived experience of technology that work well for them in the classroom, other than perhaps add digital services. And I'm generalizing for effect here. So all the super techie heads and SLT out there, I apologize. I'm just giving a generalization. And so it takes the first step is the confidence to empower middle leaders and sometimes just I say just teachers, but teachers who are there in one department doing their thing to make sure that they are part of the co-production when it comes to what do we want to achieve and what why do we want to use it um, we want to make sure that we start by understanding and surveying our staff of where are your confidence levels do an anonymous survey to all your staff asking about the core foundational tools you use in, in the in the school and see how confident they are using whether it's office 365 or google classroom um, whatever your mis system is use that as a foundation for how do we start to move forward if we then do along that survey um, something that often gets forgotten probably in most schools and mats each year you might have eight ten percent of your workforce change through progression new staff coming in and often we spend a bit of time saying this is what we use these are the tools but we rarely say what did you use before what worked really well in your previous schools? How do we capture those insights and bring mm. those into our collective mindset? But if we empower those teachers who are doing things mm. and using technology <clears throat> with confidence in the classroom to help shape part of that digital vision, not only is that co-production meant that everybody understands why we're doing it, but we're also empowering our, our cohort to actually come on the journey with us so i think you know co-production starts with the teachers and students in the classroom their collaborative experiences and how things can progress and slt's role is to shape the priorities based on those other things your own school development plan and your own priorities finance sits there and dictates the speed of the journey not the direction of travel just how you can do it and then you around that wrap in the things like your privacy and data protection, your safeguarding, your considerations for your um, 
children with um, SEND, you have your governors hopefully asking the, the, the check and challenge, why are we doing this? What are we doing? How are we going to measure performance and impact? And then you wrap your CPD around those stepping stones. Um, now, that's a really simplistic one. Beyond that, reach out to lots of people, you know, but um, we, we kicked off this conversation talking about, you know, I'm here because um, I'm passionate about developing solutions that are co-produced with educators and the intention is to do things simply. And that's act exactly the theme with what we've done with Classroom Cloud. It's not try and be the tool with the most buttons on the, the, the thing, but it's about how do we make a tool that's simple, reliable. Confidence is all about knowing that if you open an application at the start of the lesson, it will work. You won't have 30 children hanging on your word or being disruptive while you're thinking, oh my goodness, what do I do? And at the same time, instead of having lots of different tools, why not have one thing that provides you with the core functionality that you need to, to get the most out of that technology? And it is really teacher safety net. It's the tools that mean you can keep the kids focus and attention on a, the device to what you want them to be doing and keep them safe from going somewhere they shouldn't be going. Um, and I think lots of what we do in technology is now increasingly about keeping it simple, stupid which is why it comes back to the don't try and do too many things at once. Don't try and introduce too many applications at once. Build confidence in what you've got and then add layer or by layer with a clear message of how you're going to measure the impact and effectiveness of what you add. Keep it simple, stupid. There's a there's a book opportunity there, Al. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I trademark it quickly? I, don't think I, can. I think it's been used before somehow. <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, and just to reaffirm that NACE uh, and our community, we're very grateful to yourself and Classroom Cloud for your support as headline partner uh, for our research. Uh, we've got a lot of passion in the importance of research um, uh, to enable improvement into next year. So we're really grateful for your uh, support, expertise and insights uh, and we'll share them with the world. That's our next project, isn't it, Sarah, to um uh i think listen learn and share and i just want to say stupid i just want to say you know i i don't get involved on everything but this was something that i was really keen to support because i think that foundational work of getting the voice from the coalface getting the voice of schools and educators not making <laughs> assumptions based on what we think everybody else is doing yeah i think is really important because actually confidence is built from the fact of you know what it's okay we're struggling it's okay we're not the finished article because actually that's what most people really are um you know and i think that's really really important and then finally just recognizing we've got other battles as well so the more we can learn about tech that can help us on some other priorities right now and not be the pressure of what we're supposed to be doing with it the better for everybody nailed it super thank you very much thank you folks